The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. Rebound means, 1 John 1, 9, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit take the things that we note and challenge us by them. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We can't forget from whence I started this freedom series, and I'll just bring it back to mind briefly. God is omniscient. So we're going back to the very essence of God. That means God knows the knowable simultaneously from eternity past into eternity future. There's nothing that God does not know. God is all-knowing. And God also uh, is fair and just is part of justice would be part of it and God is love and you can boil it all down to the fact that in his justice because of his justice when he created the angels he gave them freedom justice and freedom go together they work in tandem and God would not create robots. He created angels who had volition. The angels were able not to sin, but obviously they were able to sin because Satan did so. And what we have to remember is that God knew that this would happen in eternity past. Yet he loved freedom so much he created these angels knowing that a third of them would reject him. And on top of that through his love and justice after Satan made an appeal because God said you are sentenced to the lake of fire. Well, Satan, as an attorney, acting as his own attorney, said, I appeal unto you, because how could a loving God send his own creation into the lake of fire? And this was Satan trying to get out of a jam, and also the fact that he's a deceiver, a liar, and a murderer from the beginning. And that was his choice, Satan's choice. And God knew that the most beautiful creature he would ever create would do this. And it was actually God the Father had the plan it was actually Jesus Christ himself who created the angels and Satan. And so Jesus Christ did that as God in eternity past knowing what would occur as a result. The angelic conflict, therefore, the need for the creation of man to resolve that conflict, to resolve the appeal trial of Satan, because Satan said basically to God, I don't believe you're just. Prove your justice. Prove your fairness. Prove your love. 
and Jesus Christ knew that this would happen in eternity past, yet he let it happen, and he did not interfere with Satan's volition, nor did he interfere with the third of the angels who decided to go along with him. Our Lord did interfere as judge in one case in which the Nephilim became a part of our history and a part of the fact of an, a satanic attack on the line of Christ, really, because Satan knew the plan that Jesus Christ would come into the world to save man, so he was going to get rid of man, and so uh, in the book of Enoch, which is not part of the Bible, but uh, the book of Enoch was found in Ethiopia, and it is believed it was taken down to Ethiopia by the Shulamite woman, and it is believed that it was taught there, and it was written in their language at that time, and according to this book, it is not the authority of the Word of God because it's not part of the canon of Scripture. But it said that 200 angels took on the form of man, came to earth, and copulated with women, the women. And then the women gave birth to Nephilim, which were half demonic, half man. They're believed to be uh, extraordinarily tall. I think three me how, how long, how big is three meters? Twelve feet? Yeah, I think they said it was thirteen feet. But anyway, that's just an extra biblical source. But we know from the Bible itself, from Moses, he wrote in Genesis of what occurred. It's a very short passage in Genesis 6, but very important, the satanic attack upon the human race very fascinating concept which we'll delve into in a moment here. But Jesus Christ, knowing that all of these things would occur, loved freedom so much that he allowed it. And even though these angels who took on the form of man in order to copulate he allowed them to do that even though they were in contempt of court. They were in contempt of court because the angelic conflict is supposed to be resolved with the angels being watchers, both demons and both the fallen angels and the uh, chosen angels, the elect angels. Both are supposed to be watchers. They're even called watchers in the Bible. And what do they do? Watch us. They watch the trial unfold. They do not tamper with the witnesses, right? Well, these fallen angels, whether it was 200 or 2,000, it doesn't really matter. We know it happened. Some angels decided to go into contempt of court. And Jesus Christ knew this, and he allowed them to do this, and he even allowed for them 
140 years for the half man, half demon population for just one of them to believe in Christ and he would have died for them as well. And boy, would I be a lot taller if it had turned out that way. <laughs> but it didn't, and he knew it wouldn't. He's omniscient. And it came down to actually only eight surviving people who were true humanity. Noah, his family, his daughters and son-in-laws and such. Eight people. That's it. And that's because when the angels, fallen angels, procreated with the women, they created this half demon, half man race. That's where we get the legends of old like Hercules and Achilles and these were real people. Actually, real hybrids. <laughs> Giant people. Powerful people. Genius people. They built, they probably built structures that we wouldn't know how to build today in our modern technology. Who knows what they built? A pyramid, maybe. I don't know. But that may have been washed away in the flood. Maybe not. I don't know. Yes. That's right. All the angels took on the form of the male. And why? Because the woman is a responder. And, well, they were just totally out of line. They were in contempt of court and the stupid women had fell head over heels for these beautiful bodied <coughs> angels, fallen <coughs> angels. Well, Jesus Christ knew this in eternity past. And he knew that Adam and Eve would make a decision against him by eating the fruit in eternity past. And he loved freedom so much that he was willing to die on the cross as a substitute for us in order to liberate us. That is something that is phenomenal. And it is something that should help you understand the entire concept of freedom from the divine viewpoint the spiritual viewpoint much better and how important it is and how Jesus Christ as supreme judge he is the ruler in the supreme court of heaven as supreme judge he gave every one of us freedom. And he is a gentleman. If you want to go off and be foolish, he allows you to go off and be foolish. If you reject him as an unbeliever, he allows you to reject him. On earth, as he was being rejected in hypostatic union, as they beat him with the cat of nine tails until his flesh became mush and he became unrecognizable. He was a pile of mush. 
and they grabbed him by his beard and ripped it out. And they no doubt grabbed him by his hair and they spit on him. And he went through the worst physical torture and that's just the physical torture than any human being has ever gone through. Even before he was going through the beatings and the lashings and the snide remarks and the people slapping him on the face do you know people slapped the God, the God, the second member of the Trinity, God, they smacked him on his face and they spit on him. And guess what? He did not react. God did not react, but actually, it is more correct to say Jesus Christ in his humanity did not react. But he knew all of this was going to happen in eternity past. And before all of the beatings began, he went into prayer. Prayer is self soothing. We are commanded to pray as Christ prayed because it keeps our focus where it needs to be oftentimes, especially during trials and tribulations. Not that you should not pray during other times as well, but most people especially pray during times of trials and tribulations. Well, Jesus Christ went in his humanity, went into intensive prayer to God the Father before this happened, the night before this happened. And he said, O oh God, let this cup pass from me, if it be thy will. But it wasn't and he knew it wasn't. And what does that tell you? Well, Jesus Christ is trying to tell us something by saying that. And that's why it's recorded in Scripture. What he's trying to tell us is, I chose to do this. There's no other way that man can be saved. If there was another way, don't you think I would have found another way? But there was no other way. This is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I've got to do this. And I'm doing it because that's how much I love freedom. And he died as a substitute for us so that we might be free in Christ and not entangled in a yoke of bondage which makes legalism so disgusting. They think they're helping God. That is an arrogance that is so deep and ignorant. It's ignorance plus arrogance. It's blinding and it's irritating when you know what our Lord went through and then stupid man is running around trying to take credit for himself for keeping his salvation. Well, you can no longer maintain eternal life no more than you can maintain your physical life. We all die, no matter what you do.
And if you were to ask them, oh, wow, you're great. You're so great. You can maintain your own eternal life. That's phenomenal. So since you can maintain your own eternal life, why don't you just go ahead and maintain your physical life forever? Because you are that powerful. Yet people don't think that way. They don't think at all. It's arrogance and it's blinding. And there are people who, are, who have doctorate degrees who are in this type of theology. It doesn't matter what your IQ is matters what your spiritual IQ is. But the point is, he loved freedom so much that he, by his own will, created what's going on right now he created the circumstances by which he would have to go to the cross. And when he was praying to God the Father, he was under such intensive pressure that he began to sweat droplets of blood. Now, I've been in enough pain before to where I've just sweat profusely and wanted to vomit beside the toilet and migraine will make you do that, etc. But to sweat blood? You can't imagine the amount of pressure our Lord was under. And he did it because he loved freedom. You see his justice his love, his righteousness demands that if God creates a creature, his love, justice, and righteousness demands that he be a gentleman and give those creatures freedom. And yet he's still the judge. This will may help you to understand what uh, we're going to study shortly in terms of the worst of the sins. Why are they the worst of the sins for the believer? Because they are in violation of principles of freedom. You are not following the royal family honor code you are one or one is not following uh, the fact that uh, Jesus Christ was such a gentleman that he let people slap him around and didn't say a word about it. He was nailed on a cross, put thorns in his head, blood running down his emaciated not destroyed face not emaciated but destroyed his he was destroyed beyond recognition became so weak he couldn't even carry his own cross oh he kept trying but he couldn't do it anymore. And he knew that would happen in eternity past. And yet he loves your freedom so much that he did that for us. And he loves us so much that he did that for us. You know, we don't even have to exist. He's God. But we do. And you say, well, why would God go through all of that? 
to demonstrate his perfection. Jesus Christ wanted to create angels, so he did. And he wanted to demonstrate perfection. He wanted to give us an opportunity to know the freedom that is in Christ. And he wants us to live with him forever in eternity. And we will. But in the meantime, we've got to understand these broad theological concepts and then be able to extrapolate them down into why things are the way they are and why the mental attitude sins which motivate the verbal sins and jealousy which often motivates murder why these sins are the worst. And it has to do with the fact that it is in, that those sins are in direct contradiction to the character of God. They are in direct contradiction to the fact that he gave us freedom and yet many, most believers won't afford freedom to anyone. They want to run everybody's life. Or they just want to, or they waste out their lives gossiping, maligning, judging, makes them feel superior. Well, that's arrogance. Jesus Christ humbled himself not only just as a man but as a servant of man. The God humbled himself to become our servant. Us vile creatures It's phenomenal. So what we lack in Christendom today is obviously positive volition. And positive volition is usually expressed when people start asking questions as to, well, why this? Well, what about this? And how? And, uh, well, how do I do this? And why is this so? And uh, some people get ahead of themselves, they, they get so positive, or they're so gung-ho at first, they get ahead of themselves and they uh, ask too many questions that are above their pay grade. They haven't gotten to there yet to uh, fully grasp the concepts. They have to go through the baby steps. They have to go to the newcomer site, and I need to put some more messages on the newcomer site, uh, uh, the page on the web page, alewisministries.org, uh, because I got through uh, the faith rest drill, at least part of it, or maybe all of it, but uh, there's much more to be taught in terms of a basic doctrine and a basic uh, vocabulary that we have, although if you look at the website, you will see that uh, there's been quite a collection of what's called essentials and that gives a description of the vocabulary that I'm using right now. In detail, I give a description of what it means, what I'm talking about, so that you can have a frame of reference and a basis for understanding And you need this vocabulary because there's no other way to express it. It's so inexpressible that it requires a vocabulary unto itself. And there's nothing 
unique about a science, and theology is a science, the science of theology. There's nothing unique about a science having its own terminology. I was watching NOVA the other day. NOVA is a science channel. And uh, this particular episode had to do with the brain. And I was fascinated by the things that they were doing. And they were showing how the brain works. And these genius psychiatrists and neurosurgeons enlisted the help of magicians because these neurosurgeons knew that it's sleight of hand. They know that what they're seeing is an illusion, but they, don't, they didn't know how it was done. Now, they wouldn't show too much because the magicians don't want to give too much away. But they did give private interviews to the doctors because the doctors aren't going to be in competition with them. They just want the information so that they can figure out how the brain works. It was fascinating for me to watch. And in our brain are electrical waves. Electric. And in, well, I guess in every, even in the animal species, there's electric, some electric, for the pumping of the heart. The very fact that your heart pumps, that's electricity. And electricity cannot be destroyed can only be transformed. I want a neurosurgeon to think about that for a while. So well, what about the animal? Well, I already know from the Bible. The animal's life is in the blood. The electricity is transformed simply by the fact that from the heat emanating from their body that the electricity you see we we produce electricity and we have a temperature of it should be 98.6 degrees that would be the normal temperature that's pretty hot what produces that temperature electricity Anyway, all of that was fascinating. And so I guess what I'm getting at is simply this. We have to start asking ourselves. I mean, I don't know why people don't run around constantly, the, what, those that are in ignorance, and ask, why am I here? What is this all about? What the hell is going on? I don't understand it one bit. But that's their volition and their freedom to live in the moment and to disregard eternity as if it's not going to happen. What a silly thing to think that we were born and we live a life and then we die and we are no more. What a silly, silly thing. We have a soul and the unbeliever has a soul and the unbeliever is going to live forever, just in a different place. We have a soul and a human spirit. We are trichotomous. 
And that human spirit is the container of what's called eternal life. And the human spirit goes with our soul to heaven. The unbeliever doesn't have the human spirit. Therefore, he can't understand anything of God. Nothing whatsoever. He's spiritually dead. So Christendom is lacking today. And when people grow older... It just seems they lose that ambition to ask why. My son, he's going to be four soon. He's in that stage. Why? 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 I love that stage. Most parents probably get irritated at it because they don't know the answer. If I don't know the answer, I say, I don't know, son. I'm not embarrassed by it. But usually I have an answer, unless it's some far out question. Uh, such as we were walking, we went to the park where they had some bison, we were walking back, I had him on my shoulders, and he heard, heard the crickets chirping. He said, Daddy, what's that? I said, what? He said, what's that noise? I said, oh, those are crickets, and they're chirping. And he said, crickets. He said, what do they look like? So I told him they were small, and they hopped around, and they made their noise by, not by chirping, but by rubbing their little tentacles together very quickly well they're short enough to be tentacles to me oh I don't know it could be their back legs but they do it by a rubbing action and um, that's how they make the noise mating call or whatever for so then he asked basically well why are they there <laughs> like what is their purpose it's basic I said well God created them and then he said why and I think I said something to the effect of uh, so we can enjoy hearing them chirp <laughs> or he would ask uh, why an animal why a certain animal I said, because God wanted man to have something to rule over. We rule over the animals. Although if you corner a bear in the wilderness, you might think differently. But if you have a shotgun with you, you rule over the animal. Most of the time, if you're a quick draw, you hit him just right. Double barrel, I hope. Yes, of course, we're much smarter than the average bear. <laughs> but uh, we do, the reason why animals are vicious today has to do with the fall of Adam and Eve. One day, I'll tell you all about it when, when we go through Genesis. They didn't acquire an old sin nature as such, but uh, when you see how they act and get jealous, if you give attention to one dog and another dog gets jealous, or if one dog is really hungry and they have one bowl to eat out, or even if they have two bowls, they'll each be eating out of their own bowl and growl at each other the whole time. And then sometimes they'll run back and forth switching bowls, thinking the other one's getting something better. Yeah, greed, jealousy in an animal. And it has to do with man's fall. The animals didn't act like that before in the Garden of Eden. And the animals won't act like that in the millennium either. Lion shall 
lie side by side with the Lamb. When I'm back on earth in the millennium, if I have an interest in it as I do now, I don't know how it'll be, but I would like to have every animal creature to pet on. I'd like to use a lion as a bed, not that I would need to sleep, but I might just want to lay on it. Feel its fur. But we will be in such a state of bliss anyway that uh, those things might not seem that important to us at all. But as people get older, they tend to lose that drive that almost every kid seems to have at around the age of three, four, and five, depending on several factors. And maybe some children don't, don't do that, but most of them go through the Y stage. And then when they get older or get teenagers and they get distracted, they don't care about the answers anymore care about the girls and the girls care about the boys and nowadays it'll be they'll be caring about who said what on Facebook about them and my boyfriend didn't push like on something that I wrote and I'm offended and they get all wrapped up in people and they stop asking why and they start searching for happiness in silly things. But they've got to have their freedom and grow up to. Now, a person like King David, positive toward the word, is very rare. He was positive as a teenager, and that is very rare, extraordinarily rare. Because teenagers get distracted very easily by entertainment, by their new hot rod, by social life, by their PlayStation or Xbox, all types of distractions. Well, David was out there with the sheep. He had a sense of responsibility while his other brothers were fooling around. And while he was out there, he kept himself occupied by learning Bible doctrine and uh, also by learning a musical instrument similar to a harp. Not quite the same. And the semitones would be quite different from what we're uh, used to. It would sound Arab-like. But what he wrote was very beautiful, I'm sure. But the music's not recorded for us because we'd be too distracted by the beautiful melody. But what was left in the Psalms, you know, that means the songs. There was music that went along to what, you know, there was music that went along to the 23rd Psalm. People try to do it themselves. You can look it up online. Or you can look up, uh, and there's many different versions of Psalm, the 23rd Psalm being sung in our modern way of how we listen to music. And... Uh, Well, I can tell you it's nothing compared to what David wrote in his music. But he was positive as a teenager. And he spent his time meditating on the Lord. He spent his time protecting the sheep. And as part of that, he spent his time practicing with a sling. Not a slingshot, but a thing that he would swing around his head and release at the right time and he got 
so proficient at, at this that it became almost like a bullet. That was his shotgun. And he was obviously a very strong young man. And he, he would just practice that and practice that and practice that and practice that. Then when he got tired of that, he would practice his music and practice his music and practice his music and watch the sheep. And if the sheep seemed disturbed, he would play the music for the sheep and that would calm them down. And then uh, he would meditate on the Lord and he would write psalms, songs to the Lord or about the Lord. They were actually songs to himself, but they were about the Lord. And many of those are recorded in psalms. And even if you read psalms in the English, in the NIV version or NASB, even if you try it out in the King James version, it sounds pretty, even though it's coming from Hebrew, where it sounds even prettier. Well, David was positive toward the Word of God. Not only that, he was a super genius in many areas. Super genius in music, a super genius in writing because he was able to put the melody with such a, a beautiful phonetic words that went along with the songs. But the greatest thing about David Bible doctrine and he was positive toward it as a teenager so he's the one that did not stop asking why he asked why and he got an answer and whenever you ask why and you really mean it and you're not just being arrogant and you're not uh, overthinking and you're not trying to question God but what you're doing is it's just simply seeking an answer you'll get it you'll get the answer maybe not at the immediate time you want it but you'll get it when God knows you're ready for it and you might have to go through a lot of testing first before you even understand it so what is lacking today in Christianity is mechanics totally lacking and what I mean by mechanics is how do you do something? It's amazing to me they have all of these self-help books and self-help guides. And uh, I was reading the other day on the fastest way to make money as a blogger is to do the self-help type of material, the how-to type material. So people are always trying to figure out how to do something but they're not trying to figure out the most important thing, how to live their lives in the light of eternity. And I'm talking about believers. And believers will go out and buy some motivational speakers nonsense and listen to it. They might get emotionally jazzed about it. And the guy might have some good principles related to how to make money and a lot of human viewpoint but other than that it's worthless when it comes to eternity and they spend all their time just mesmerized with that stuff and they can't spend an hour a day learning Bible doctrine unbelievable that's volition and God respects that volition I respect that volition too. I know I can't change anybody's mind. They're going to believe what they're going to believe. And that's it. And you say, but you're a pastor. Yeah, I stand behind a pulpit and I talk. God provides the hearers. And he does. You say, where are they? They're out there. You just don't know it. And uh, they kept listening, or maybe new people were stopping by, even during 
the long hiatus of when the website was kind of down and I was not preaching and I thought that when I would go back in the website they have a statistics page I'm not into numbers but you know just out of curiosity I thought well I bet by now it fell down to about zero nope it actually maintained about the same actually this month a little higher than last month <laughs> and we're not through with the month yet oh there was that one month when I distributed the evangelistic things around the neighborhood and that that showed a spike it showed a difference a slight difference maybe 20% difference but I know there's the regulars on there and I hope I'm not boring them by going off subject let me keep on the subject and the subject has to do with well I'm, I started off by simply telling you about the essence of God to reorient us to our subject of freedom and to the overall subject matter in terms of its uh, theological uh, implications so that we can break it down categorically which is what we'll do right now so here's a question why in Proverbs does God list certain sins as the worst and why are they the worst you know God is not arbitrary there's a reason why they are the worst sins and of course we still have the categories of sins and that's how we learn about it and categories are necessary for our assim assimilation uh, because that is how weak our human mind is that we have to categorize it to be able to recall it quickly that's how our brain was designed you know a computer it doesn't really categorize well it depends on the programmer but a computer for example I was watching on Nova again they were showing how they were making artificial intelligence and they had this supercomputer they had created to play Jeopardy along with other human beings that's not a human being of course it's a machine they were treating it like it was real no it, it had been programmed by man but uh, it could its process was so fast it would just it didn't use categories it simply used the process of elimination and then it used statistics and lo and it used a type of logic the computer logic but it used it really used uh, I think I'm saying it uh, correctly when I say it used uh, the uh, I think I just the statistics you take I don't know if you've ever taken statistics before I'm sure my dad did well a computer is just goes right through statistics zam 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 and it just matches up statistics it's not categorizing so a question would be asked and the computer was so fast at picking out words associating them and disassociating them and just simply systematically by a simple act of had a fast way of doing 
statistics. That's all. No categorization. Now, the people, on the other hand, when they heard the question, if they didn't have that in a category of their stream of consciousness, they would not be able to pull out the answer very quickly. And so, but if they had categorized it, they would have had the answer faster than the computer. But uh, you see, we're, we're just not as fast as at statistics at getting through those things. But we need categories. But there's a reason, but we still need to look at the overall picture as to why, why One thing that's not understood in my generation is the prohibitions against any type of sex they want to have. Inside of, or outside of marriage, sex, sex with uh, different partners, many different partners, living with one another, living with many different partners, uh, sex with multiple partners at the same time, uh, sex with the same sex, homosexuality, and uh, they're just all uh, hypersexual. But that's nothing new in history. When New York City was uh, founded, and it had a population, it grew to about the size of Spartanburg at the time, which was at that time pretty big, about 30,000 people, 30, 40,000 people. 80% of the women in the city were prostitutes. And that was the formation of a client nation. And then you say, well, how can that be? Don't you remember Hosea? My people perish from lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of divine establishment principles, obviously. They had a lack of knowledge in that regard in terms of prostitution which was legal at the time in our country and in certain areas, not in pilgrim country. But uh, the point I'm getting at is there was a pivot though. Even though there was sin all around, that's what people do, people sin. That does not mitigate the fact that we are on a moral decline, a social decline. That's part of the second cycle of discipline. It's obvious. And it's obvious that in terms of responsibility, it's never been so bad. You see, in the past, oh, oh, people messed around in the past, no doubt about it. But they wouldn't dare get divorced, not even over messing around. A lot of women knew their men had mistresses, they would overlook it because of their children. They needed their daddy. They needed a daddy and a mommy. And even though daddy was running around being foolish, the sense of priority for the woman was, I do not get divorced because I have responsibility. And we've been watching on television a lot of things through history. And I'm sure you were pretty shocked by a lot of what you saw. I wasn't. I'm sure you were pretty shocked to hear. Well, I was shocked to hear some things about Abraham Lincoln. A little bit. Didn't bother me any. I'm just a little bit shocked about it. So uh, we all have old sin nature, so we need to get off that rant. We need to stop looking at people and, and, and uh, saying, They're, I will judge them by their sins. If they sin in this manner, they are not 
uh, great people at all. They're terrible people uh, because their sins are different than mine. If they would sin like I do, if they would gossip like I do, I wish they would gossip like I do so we would have something to talk about. But they don't. They're too interested in something I don't like, and I don't like them doing it. I hate seeing them do what they do because I don't do those things. Or maybe I can't do those things. <laughs> I wish I could do those things. They might have in say in jealousy. But my, no, I'm better than. One thing we should all know that every single one of us is depraved and has an old sin nature. Every single one of us has it in our capacity to be absolutely rotten. I was talking to my aunt last night and uh, she said uh, that she had a conversation with the pastor's mother. And the pastor's mother said that she had a long and good conversation with me and that I seemed like a very nice man. And Donna said, yes, he's a very nice man. Well, I didn't remember the lady. I'm sorry. But I don't remember who it was. I don't even remember what his mother looked like. I didn't even know his mother was there. But I mean, she was just someone talking to me. I didn't know who it was. And uh, I was talking to so many people. That, and I'm not good with names anyway. I don't uh, concentrate on names. I concentrate on what's being said at the time. I can look at a face. Other than that, I'm terrible with names. There's one area where I don't concentrate for some reason. Because I, I just think, well, the conversation is more important. I'll probably never see this person again anyway. What's in a name? Well, a lot, really. You should remember the name. But she uh, said, Donna said, yeah, he is. He's a very nice man. And I said, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> and she said, well, yeah. I think most of us are good most of the time and I was thinking no most people are rotten most of the time but whatever we're entitled to our own opinions she you can see things through rosy glasses or you can see things in reality or you can see things pessimistically however you want but you see my generation doesn't understand these prohibitions against uh, fornication or a prohibition against uh, just sleeping with one another or the prohibition against homosexuality. They almost sneer at it like it's a silly thing. How silly. How silly for someone not to understand that a person of the same sex can love another person intimately and sexually, uh, another person of the same sex. Well, some people have that weakness. It's not mine, by golly, but some people have that weakness. Apparently, Abraham Lincoln did for a while. And... Uh, but it's just, uh, it's almost as if they're mocking it. And, uh, but they don't ever, but they, they might say, well, why can't I? Well, why can't I? They just think it's a prohibition just to be a prohibition. Or they've seen legalism up front and firsthand and they rejected it because they saw the hypocrisy in it. But the prohibition is there for a reason. It's to protect freedom, to protect family, to protect marriage and the institution of marriage, to protect society, to protect you, 
to protect yourself, to protect your soul, to protect your happiness, to protect your very own freedom. Otherwise, you'll become a slave to antinomianism, just as others become a slave to legalism. And they will never understand this generation of mine is going to be the largest in all of our history in which right man and right woman didn't hook up or if they did hook up, they got divorced anyway. And the reason is because they don't understand principle They don't understand the fact that marriage is an institution. Marriage was not designed to make you happy. Marriage is an institution. You're institutionalized, <laughs> see? In fact, there's, it's more than likely that it will intensify your, well, it will intensify your problems. Now, if you go into a marriage and you have very few problems and you have everything pretty much straightened out, and you say, oh, I probably have about two problems over here I need to take care of, then the other person that comes in, they come in with a baggage of about 100 problems. Well, guess what? You take 100 times 2, and now you have 200 problems. <laughs> That's how it'll feel. But you have to be able to deal with it with impersonal love. And, of course, it takes two to tango. So sometimes it doesn't work out because people think they can just walk, walk out on an institution, a God's institution, as if there's no punishment involved, as if, there's, if, as if they're an island to themselves, as if they're not affecting their own children, as if they're not affecting their own lives, their own soul, their own freedom. Very selfish generation that we live in. My generation, very selfish. Extraordinarily selfish. You know, I think the greatest generation is your generation. I don't even think it was the World War II generation. I think it was the Vietnam generation. Because never before had our pivot gotten so large. And never before had so many people understood the Christian way of life. The colonel was sending out upwards of a million tapes during the early 80s. That was your generation doing that. My generation doesn't know who the guy is. And uh, the people I know from high school and all of that, they see the... Uh, fact that I'm a pastor they don't uh, they don't get it they might have listened out of curiosity and then they backed way away because they're negative I did have one young lady that I had gone to school with send me some cookies because I'm a pastor and I talked to her once on the phone, once or twice. She said, I heard what you were saying yesterday. And I believe at the time she was going through some part of essentials. And I was talking about uh, possibly reversionism. It doesn't really matter. But I said, well, did you understand it? Did you understand it? She said, I'm not being condescending. I'm just wondering 
was it understandable to you? She said, yeah, I pretty much got the concept. Well, now she's in the holiness, holy roller movement. I drove her straight into the holy roller movement. She told me the other day, yeah, you just got to feel it. You got to get out there and you got to, you got to get revved up emotionally and I don't know how she put it, but uh, I did not argue with her. It was her choice. You see, I was a gentleman. She'd already listened to me, and then she decided to go in for the crazy, craziness instead of the sanity. That's the way most people are. So very quickly now, my generation doesn't understand that. My generation is mainly an antinomian generation. Though, at the same time, they're antinomian. I have noticed, holy cow, that I've gone over time. But, not only have I noticed that they are an antinomian generation, but at the same time, they're judgmental in a different way. Actually, what my generation does is what a lot of people do in general. They peg people. And that's what we're going to get into in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19 tomorrow. And we will get through it tomorrow because we'll have two Bible classes Sunday morning if you wish it to be morning. To get it out of the way, I think Sunday morning sounds good. And uh, we will go over, I'm going to wrap it up here soon, but we will go over Proverbs 6, 17 through 19. And actually it begins in verse 16, an explanation. And it gives the top sins in, that, in those verses. And we're going to study, why are those the worst of the sins and how come fornication isn't listed I was just talking about that when it's so destructive as the worst it is listed as a sin of course and just because it's not the worst doesn't mean you can run out and do it there's severe punishment that goes along with that you ever heard of venereal disease you see, my generation doesn't ask why. They think they can fornicate and they think they can do whatever they want and uh, uh, they can be homosexual and they can get into any deviant activity they want to get into. And did it ever cross their mind? Did they ever ask themselves, why is there a venereal disease? Why are there venereal diseases? especially made for a certain part of your body. Isn't that weird? Wouldn't you think? It's because God prohibited it and He's going to give you some motivation to stay away from it. It's called herpes. I heard the other day that one out of four Americans has herpes. The, not the herpes simplex of the lip. About 80% of us have herpes that's not, it's called herpes 1. That's related to any type of blisters that you get in your mouth that usually occur when you're about to get a cold or you're under stress. I don't know if I have that because I can't recall having a blister in my mouth. I may be at one time uh, when I was a teenager. Other than that, uh, I guess it's in remission. But, and, uh, but I'm talking about the herpes 2 simplex virus, which is sexually transmitted, and that's where you get those, I guess, the same type blisters on your genitalia. And that doesn't sound fun at all. You see, 
you mock God and you think you're having fun and you're laughing, your laughter will be turned to tears of bitterness. And AIDS is mainly a sexually transmitted disease. There are innocent people who get the virus, I know. You don't have to scream at me for bringing that up. For most, it's because of homosexuality or an extraordinarily promiscuous life or the sharing of needles, as in drug abuse. And uh, back in the 80s, of course, it used to happen. It would get, people would get accidentally receive it in blood transfusion, but they test that very thoroughly now. But I'm sure uh, it, every now and then there's a slip up, a, a nurse gets pricked by a needle and ends up with, AIDS. That's a very dangerous profession, especially in the mental health field where you have these people coming in there sometimes strung out on drugs. I had to be, be there one time watching this, this person just totally strung out on drugs and uh, or they were wanting drugs and they wouldn't give them drugs and she said, I'll just go on the street and get it then. And so, well, what you doing here? Get out of here, you're acting crazy. Uh, but uh, she wanted to get it free, see, from the government. And uh, there's no telling what that lady had, but she was threatening to stab people with the, she said, I'll take the needle and stab you with it and all this stuff. and it, and they all, and they all um, I had to sit in the classes even though I wasn't part of the nursing area. But I had to sit in the classes just in case some nut were to run into the department that I worked in. And uh, they gave us procedures if we are pricked with a needle, what to do, what to do immediately, and how you have to do it. And then you have to take all these tests to follow up, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, why, why venereal disease? Well, God invented venereal disease. He told you not to do something. You do it anyway, and you get a disease from it. Now you're in pain, and you're wondering why. Well, you're a dummy. If you're going to get one, at least know why you got it. <laughs> you messed up. But people don't think today and our country is suffering because of it and we're moving through the cycles of discipline rapidly. And there needs to be a wake-up call and we will see what happens. But it's going to have to happen very quickly because when I hear pundits on television I think two or three people in a row yesterday, the whole subject was the fall of the United States of America. And I said, well, once this is, uh, once the world that doesn't know Bible doctrine and may not even be believers, once they know it's on its way out, we're in deep, deep trouble. The only people in La La Land are on NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, or uh, as Rush Limbaugh likes to say, PMSNBC. But um, anyway, we are in serious trouble as a country, and it all boils down to the fact that we lack knowledge as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So tomorrow, we will continue with our learning of knowledge so that we're not in that same position and so that when the storm comes, it's already here actually, but when the storm gets more vicious and the eye wall of the hurricane starts hitting us, we'll be perfectly protected because we were the few.
who decided to latch on to knowledge, knowledge of Bible doctrine. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom that we've had to assimilate this portion of the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.